Welcome to another Astro Dimitrios video. Uh, this is the first video in our awesome astronomer series. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Sunaina Bhagava, who's with us today. Hey. Hello. So Hi, first of all, how are you? I am good. I am good, thank you. It's an interesting mm -hmm. time we're in, but I am handling it okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, so congratulations first on passing your Viva. So just tell us a bit about that. Thank you. So um, a Viva or a defense if you're in the US is basically um, an oral exam that PhD students take at the end of their degrees, um, where they basically have to defend and talk about everything that they did in their research. So depending on where you are in the world, it can either be a very like breezy process where you just give a talk for about an hour and you get some questions at the end, or you can be locked in a room with your your examiners for four hours and they grill you page by page. Um, so mine was the latter, but very pleased to have uh, come out the other side and finished and passed. So it's pretty great. Amazing. Well, well done. That must be a, a huge accomplishment. Um, so why don't you start then by telling us um, a bit about yourself and then your research that you did for your PhD. And also we should mention that you did your PhD at the University of Sussex. Yes. Um, so I've come very much to the end of my PhD now, but I was a PhD student for about the last three and a half-ish years. So I finished pretty close to being on time um, because in the UK, PhDs, at least in physics, are funded by the Science Technologies Funding Council, which funds you for three and a half years. You're allowed to be registered for four. So it's a nice little buffer period if you need the extra time, but your funding runs out after three and a half. Um, and very much squarely been planted in the field of studying the largest objects in the universe. So, um, or should I say the largest gravitationally collapsed objects in the universe, um, which is galaxy clusters. And these are these gigantic um, structures that took the longest to form in our uh, idea of how the universe came to be uh, as it is today. Um, and they contain, because they're so massive, they contain a world wealth of knowledge about um, stars and stellar histories and various different astrophysical processes but they also shine a light on um, parts of the universe that we can't see so as we know that there's a big mysterious component of our mass in the universe that's missing um, or that's uh, invisible to us which is dark matter and there's also an even more mysterious component of this weird sort of vacuum energy thing that's accelerating the universe which is called dark energy and galaxy clusters help us to understand understand that in some detail too. Well that sounds great. So a lot of our viewers will also be students um, like mine who are at uh, A levels doing their A levels. So could you just walk us through maybe um, bef just before university what sort of led you to study physics at university? Sure. Um, so I have to cast my mind back not too long. I'm not that old but um, long enough. So I went when I was at A-levels, I was definitely quite interested in sciences, but I wasn't really sure like which sciences in particular I was more suited for. So during my GCSEs, I did triple science, which in the UK is basically like you get an individual kind of credit for biology, chemistry and physics. I enjoyed biology and I enjoyed physics and my chemistry teacher did not think I had an aptitude for chemistry. So that kind of fell by the wayside pretty quickly. Um, and then biology was great, but something about my physics teacher... Um, at GCSE definitely gave me like a very specific kind of spark to want to keep doing physics in particular. So then I picked that at A level and then from there it was just kind of smooth sailing. Like he was a very inspiring physics teacher. He was the one of the only people in my high school who had a doctorate as well. So as you know, like you tend to call your teachers like Mr. Da -da -da or Mrs. or Miss, um, but he was like one of the few doctors in the school. So it was very clear that he himself was super passionate about physics in his heyday. And um, I really enjoyed that. But at the same time, I was very passionate about English. So I was also doing an A-level in English literature at the same time. And um, for a while, I was really confused. So when it came to the university application process, I was very, very close to putting all my applications for an English lit degree um, rather than a physics one. And it took like an awful lot of soul searching. And like I was being pulled up both sides by my English teacher and my physics teacher to be like, no, do this, do this. 
and then I thought about it some more and in the end the physics obviously won my rationale was more that I would always be able to pick up English in some capacity because I will always enjoy reading and I'll love reading but something specific to physics requires like in-depth training and it requires someone to sort of hold your hand at the beginning to talk you through very complicated concepts and I didn't have too much faith in myself that I'd be able to do that independently so I kind of won it in the end and to be honest it was it was definitely the better choice that I probably the best choice I've made. So. And so the astronomy where did that come in was that more at university where you decided that astronomy and, and space was where you wanted to go or was that earlier when you were doing your A-levels? It came really late actually. Um, it's, it's quite remarkable that I ended up doing my PhD in astro because my um, physics degree at undergrad was generalized but then I hated labs so I transferred out of the general um, physics course at undergrad and opted to do theoretical physics because mostly because I just wanted to get out of labs, but I also really enjoyed the maths aspect. Um, so I took some different courses in like complex analysis and group theory instead of having to do the normal kind of lab classes. And I enjoyed that a lot more. And then after, the, after I'd finished, I'd only taken one astrophysics course. Um, so I wasn't super well versed, but then when it came to wanting to do my master's, I had the option of either staying at my university and doing this four-year integrated course which is called an MSI or an MPhys depending on where you are or transferring um, to another place um, to do a separate individual one-year full master's course and um, for a combination of various reasons it, it was sort of like a there was a weird overabundance of scholarships to do a master's course um, for one year and there was a lot of funding available so I applied for that and they looked at my grades and everything and they gave me a full scholarship to study a master's degree and I chose UCL to do that because they did have a dedicated astro course so I think it was somewhere around the time that I was picking what I wanted to do my master's in that like something about astrophysics just felt kind of more right because it wasn't very, very lab-like but it also wasn't super 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 theoretical and um, like like particle physics for example so I think that's where my paths slowly started to kind of become a bit clearer. Very nice so it was the masters then when you started your work in galaxy clusters or was that when you started your PhD? That's also that's also a good question. So definitely I didn't start working on galaxy clusters until I started at Sussex. So during my masters I worked with um, uh, Professor Ophila Hav and he does a lot of work on various aspects of cosmology but he was particularly interested in these uh, this class of stars that um, that are at the end of their, their stellar history and um, they, they produce these spectacular explosions called supernova and um, a particular class of them have a very clear well understood relationship between their intrinsic brightness and how they look on the sky and that relationship can be used to figure out how far away they are from us and in turn help us find out how fast the universe is expanding. So I did a lot of work on supernovae um, specifically trying to analyze um, the light that they produce over time which is is known as a light curve. So I looked at a lot of a kind of stellar data. I looked at a lot of um, survey data for the first time as well. Um, but that was very much where I was based. So I didn't even, and because stars are so distinct from even galaxy studies, I didn't know very much about a lot of the main kind of galactic dynamics aspects of things until I started at Sussex. So I went from small supernovae to the largest objects. That's so cool. So let's um, let's move on to your PhD then at Sussex. So you were recently awarded the Adam Wheeler Doctoral Impact Award, and that was for your work um, on galaxy clusters. And your supervisor, Dr. Kathy Mimmer, said that you killed off an entire subfield of physics, which is very dramatic. So can you explain to us uh, what, what she meant by that and uh, how you did it? Sure. Um... I, for the record, I had no idea that she gave that particular phrasing. I think it's extremely provocative and I would personally not have used it. Um, physics, as you know, is um, hopefully it's changing, but it is still very much protected by the old God. So um, if any kind of insurgent comes in with a new theory or a new idea, it can be very scary and difficult. Um, uh, so I was very reluctant to try and overhype my work, but definitely Kathy thought that it was it worth um, singing about at least a little bit. But basically, um, this work that I did kind of fell into my lap 
sort of by coincidence. Um, but effectively, in 2014, uh, a study by a group of people at Harvard looking at um, X-ray data from um, galaxy clusters. So galaxy clusters look spectacular in, in the optical wavelengths, and I'll show you some pictures later, but they also look very beautiful in um, X-ray wavelengths because those are high energy um, processes are happening within them. So we can look at those with our space telescopes. And what this team in 2014 found was that there was an anomalous bright line in the spectrum of some galaxy clusters, this energy of about 3.5-ish kilo electron volts, which is a specific high energy unit um, that you use for uh, X-ray wavelengths. And according to them, a line of that energy had previously not been found before in those spectrum. And bear in mind, people have been studying galaxy clusters for decades, so they really understand a lot of the emission processes that happen in them. They couldn't identify the origin of this three and a half kV line. And one of the potential that they had for this is that it could be coming from a specific kind of dark matter candidate. So dark matter, as we know, we don't really understand it. We have a few ideas for what it could be like if it were a particle, but it could also be, um, for example, a kind of modification of gravity. Um, so what they did was they posited a particular dark matter candidate called the sterile neutrino, which has the potential to decay into a different state and in doing so release a photon that would have exactly that energy that they were able to find. And this was obviously super interesting. Loads of people decided to go point their telescopes at a lot of X-ray bright objects. So they looked at the Milky Way, um, which also has diffuse X-ray emission. They looked at Andromeda, which is our nearest galaxy neighbor. They looked at these very dense dark matter rich objects that are not very bright called dwarf galaxies. Um, and they looked at a few other places as well. And the consensus was mixed. So they weren't sure whether or not they had found a line. Some places, some, some people had, some people hadn't. People looked with different telescopes um, and basically created a very sort of interesting discourse around what this line is, where it comes from, whether it has a feasible interpretation or whether it is some brand new interesting physics. So then I went in and I decided that I was going to have a look at that data myself because it's publicly available. Um, and then I analyzed it in a slightly different way to the way that they had analyzed their study. And I surveyed more clusters than they had done as well to try and get more data, better constraints and so on. And one thing that we found was that we weren't able to recover a line across our sample of clusters as a whole, implying that we don't think that this is a globally dominant feature across clusters, which it would be if it were coming from dark matter but somehow specific to some individual clusters in our analysis. So something very interesting is going on in a few candidate cases where we are seeing this line. The line does exist, but we are not convinced that it's coming from dark matter. So we have a lot of interesting avenues that we can go down as to what it could be. But as far as the litmus test goes to see whether or not this is something that's coming from dark matter halos, um, we were able to at least, I'm still very reluctant to somewhat conclusively rule it out, so um, we'll see what happens in terms of future studies. We're due to have more X-ray tel telescopes go up in the future that are very specifically um, calibrated to be able to understand these X-ray lines. But um, yeah, that was pretty. That was pretty. I was pretty stoked about that. It's very rare that you get to find something that's pretty conclusive in your PhD. So yeah, that sounds great. And then of course it's it's another unknown. Because the great thing, obviously, that we both know about as astronomy is is that it's very much you you observe something and then you can either fit that to a hypothesis and you have to you change it around it's it's a very different science to say um, quantum technology which is still physics yeah. so uh, obviously this channel is about astronomy but it's also about python and coding and how that helps us as astronomers so i know you have some code and some images that you'd like to share with us to uh, show us how you use Python in your research. Yeah, um, I will show you a couple of images here. So as to what I was talking about earlier, where we were mentioning these massive gravitationally capped objects, galaxy clusters that look pretty spectacular um, in the, this is an optical image. So this is taken in three optical bands, which, um, which are basically uh, red, green, and kind of an, an intermediate within, within the optical uh, wavelength range. So what you can do is you can stack those images on top of each other and you create what looks like this. And the whole point is you're able to get a good handle on the different colors of objects. What's important to note here is that 
all of these galaxies are very much similar colors and because they all share the same sort of stellar history they all started forming stars at roughly the same time and they all grew together and that's a very clear kind of signature that they were um, that they're all part of the same system as opposed to uh, having one star here and a star in the background that look as though that they're in the same place but actually it's what what's known as a projection effect um, and what you can see here is that and then, and then, so this is the optical image. This is actually a very big, beautiful cluster called Abel um, 1689. And um, one interesting th thing about this cluster is because clusters are so large, they have the ability to, um, to gravitationally lens objects in the background, which is basically a very similar phenomenon to how light gets bent when it goes through a magnifying lens. But instead of a magnifying lens, imagine that the magnifying lens is the gravitational potential of a very massive object, which in this case is a cluster. And this cluster, in fact, was responsible for discovering um, a galaxy in the background. So a very distant galaxy that was um, it's about a redshift of 7.6, which is approximately when the universe was about 700 million years old, which seems old, but the universe is currently 14 billion years old. So it was about 5% of the age that it is now. Um, was lensed by it and they were able to deduce that that was that galaxy existed and at the time in 2008 when they made that discovery that was the most distant galaxy that they had ever found. So this is a pretty interesting cluster. I didn't actually know this when I was finding the image but then I did some research and thought it was pretty cool. Um, so now let's just pivot to the x-ray data for this image. So as I said not only do we have these bright um, star form these um, bright stellar galaxies um, within the galaxy cluster we also have this diffuse kind of x-ray emission that's also persisting between the galaxies which is basically um, because there is a very high energy plasma in between the clusters where between the member galaxies and we can see this very clearly and this is super distinct in our x-ray images so this is using an x-ray telescope called Exima newton and the red in the center is where the x-ray emission is really peaked so um, where the gas is very dense and as you move out to the outskirts of the cluster you're able to sort of see sort of uh, more diffuse gas um, and I show you this image because what we can use Python to do is combine these two in a very interesting way. So um, I'll just, I'll stop sharing the images right now and just show you some code real quick. Um, so this is what an example of a code looks like with this. And forgive me, don't look at this too closely because I do indulge in bad coding habits. Um, but effectively what we can do is the image, the images that I show you um, tend to come in a format called FITS, which stands for Flexible Image Transport System, which if you're an astronomer, you're probably very familiar with. It's a very sort of dynamic format that a lot of people use because it's very easy to, um, it basically consists of various arrays, which are basically grids of numbers, but stacked on top of each other that provide different bits of information about what you're looking at. So one thing you can do is that you can load a particular module um, of Python called APLPy, which stands for, I think, Astronomical Plotting Library in Python. And these bread and, kind of bread and butter modules here, so NumPy and PyFits, which is basically uh, an interface where you can pass FITS data using, um, using Python. And then what we can do is, um, I've generalized this, so it just points to a generic example, but you can basically just load in an image, you can define relevant, um, relevant data columns, um, and then you can effectively merge the I band, the R band, and the G band of the optical wavelengths that I was describing earlier into one image. And then the cool bit comes in because you can also um, load a sub module of this plotting library called show contour, which basically maps on the x-ray data from the image I showed you onto the optical image. And you can choose what intervals you want to map those contours onto. So I fine grained this quite a lot. So you can see that there is very, um, there is at least 10 different layers here um, or more, I think, where you can basically see how they've defined the contours in that image. And then you can output it in whatever format you want. So I've just chosen, I've chosen three distinct scales because I was looking at images of different sizes to see the cluster in different levels of detail. And then I just saved them as specific um, as, as with individual markers so I can distinguish between them. Um, and that's, that's one example of how I use Python in my research to make these, um, these cool x-ray images with um, these cool optical images with x-ray contours. And I, I must say your code is a lot cleaner than mine. 
Um, so, so don't worry at all about that. Um, mine is is a complete mess, and I I put mine online for everybody to see. So, <laughs> um, so in terms of education. How important do you think it is for students to learn some form of coding? I think it's, in, it's becoming increasingly more important. When I was in school, and I'm not that old, but um, when, I was in, when I was in high school, I definitely didn't take any computing courses. Like I didn't do a computer science A-level. Um, I, I did some bread and butter IT, but as you know, typical IT classes don't teach you coding. They, they teach you things like, how to use Microsoft Office and how to and mail merge, which are very important applications, but they don't teach you uh, anything that requires you to sort of compile things from scratch, for example. So when I first started my undergrad degree, um, and this is a very choice, most unis don't do this, but my, my university decided that they wanted to introduce us to co computing via the language Fortran. And Fortran, if, if you've done some reading around it, is a very kind of historically good language but it's 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 not very user friendly like it's it's very difficult to kind of understand the syntax and it can be very clunky the errors aren't super clear and i had to start with that and i remember struggling a lot and i wondered whether i would have struggled as much had I taken some computing courses um, I think because the nature of the, the beast in physics at the moment is very much data oriented more and more telescopes are coming online where we've got gigabytes if not terabytes of data to coming in daily um, it's very important to know at least how to code to be able to reduce that large volume of data into things you can analyze um, but depending on what else you do if you're more interested in theory you can easily code in to things like math so like mathematical or wolfram alpha for example are very specific to needing to do mathematical applications rather than just data but I think it is becoming increasingly significant now. And I'm, I get the impression that coding is now a much more mainstream aspect of most physics courses, at least. And hopefully they're not all just learning. For I time. think it is trickling down because I, I remember when I started looking at universities, part of what I was looking for was what coding, what languages they were teaching their physics students. And I remember some of them saying Fortran and I, I was like, no, I, I know that we should be learning Python or, you know, something newer, um, or maybe C. So that was part of my decision. And I know now that, that obviously this is trickling down into the national curriculum where uh, students have to learn scratch. And then uh, certainly at my school, the children learn Python at some stage during their time mm -hmm. with us. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that things like Python are very useful because they, they, allow you to do a lot of work on like the front end um, in terms of actually using it to get results out without necessarily needing to know too much about what's happening behind the scenes which I know there are arguments for and against this because you can it's better if you understand the the code completely in depth but depending on what you're using it for you don't really need to do that and Python have are a very great language in the sense I'd say they're able to interface very well um, you can import a module and you can get it to do what you want and it's very quick. So I think that is definitely the way to go in terms of like future, future university courses or even like A-level courses where they teach computing. Exactly. And I know in terms of um, astronomy, we have a, a lot of great Python modules and, and libraries that we have access to like AstroPy, there's SunPy, which I've been dabbling in, uh, which does stellar physics using Python, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. And they're obviously actively being worked on. Um, so we've talked about, before your PhD, we talked about your doctoral work. Um, where are you going next? So um, I have recently accepted, well, I say recently, this coronavirus has definitely extended my notion of time, but I am basically moving to uh, um, Paris. Uh, in the next few months or so to start a, uh, a postdoc position. So a postdoc is short for postdoctoral researcher, which is basically the step above um, a PhD that's still kind of in the academic uh, pipeline track. So I'll be starting there around September time. And a lot of the work I'll be doing is very, very related to the stuff that I've been doing now. So the, the X-ray sky is ripe for data analysis. And I've been kind of tethered to one instrument, which is XMM-Newton, which has a, a slightly older sister called Chandra, which some people will be familiar with. Um, 
and you can define certain patches of the sky that you want to analyze. So the one I've been working on is the XMM cluster survey, whereas the one that I'll be working on with some collaborators in France is known as the XXL region, which is uh, another deeper square of sky, which they've been able to get some really interesting analysis for specific galaxy clusters. A oh, very nice. Nice. Well, um, thank you so much for your time and being our first uh, awesome astronomer on this channel. Thanks for having me. It was super fun. Um, and for everybody listening or watching later, um, I'm going to link to Nana's Twitter in the description below. So look down now and you'll be able to find her on Twitter. Um, and I will also try and link to her thesis when that goes uh, online. So thank you for joining joining us and uh, stay tuned. We will try and get the next awesome astronomer video out soon. Thanks for watching. Bye everyone.